Hello, and welcome to Silicon Alley Podcast. I'm your host, William Glass, CEO and co-founder of Ostrich. And today I'm sitting down with Prakash Chandran, who is the co-founder of Xano. Xano is a no-code backend tool. And we go really deep into what that means, but if you've listened to this podcast or watched any of the videos on YouTube, then you know that I'm a big fan of no code as a great way to build MVPs, quick products, and get yourself started. I've talked a little bit about Xano, and it's my pleasure to actually sit down with Prakash. He reached out after a video that I created um, where I talked about the pros and cons of Xano, and we had a really great conversation, and I thought it would be fun to have him on the show. And what I really like about this conversation is while we definitely talk about no-code tools and no-code development, we really get into what you need to do to build a product that's going to be successful. And Prakash goes deep based on his background in user experience, customer journey, um, to really talk about user-centric design and how do you not just create an awesome product that people love, but how do you create that experience from discovery to learning to education to becoming a paying customer and getting value in perpetuity. And so that's what I think is really great about this episode is we're going to go deep into that process, the user experience, that customer journey. Um, And uh, Prakash has a really interesting story of how they actually founded Xano, turning it from an internal tool into a tool that anyone can use. And so um, it's a really fun conversation. So without further ado, I hope you enjoy today's episode of the Silicon Alley Podcast featuring the Prakash Chandran. Are you interested in growing and scaling your business? Welcome to the Silicon Alley Podcast, where you'll hear from entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, and top performers on what it truly takes to grow and scale a business. You'll walk away with actionable insights you can apply in your own business and life. Now to William Glass, the CEO and co-founder of Ostrich, and your host of the Silicon Alley Podcast. Prakash, welcome to the Silicon Alley Podcast. I'm super excited to have you on today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Yeah, and... Um, There's a a lot of topics I think we're going to cover today. Um, You are the founder of Xano, which I've talked about on YouTube videos and shared a little bit about as a no-code backend tool, which is really awesome. So we'll definitely dive into that. UI UX, you've got a ton of experience, and I'm curious to see how Xano plays in with your experience on that front. Um, But I actually want to start somewhere that's a little maybe out of left field. Um, So you host a podcast, I'm not mistaken, called Radio MD, where you talk to doctors around the country. Talk to me about how that plays into everything else that you do in the uh, tech space, because it seems so, you know, out of left field. Yeah, uh, it is out of left field. Um, You know, so one of the uh, clients that I used to consult for years ago, she uh, is the radio personality, Deborah Howell for uh, 94.7 The Wave in Southern California, for those of you that live there, the silky smooth afternoon time voice. (laughs) Um, So anyways, on the side, she does a lot of voiceover and a lot of, you know, side gigs as a podcast host and Dr. Podcasting Radio MD was looking for a new host. And so she approached me and she said, hey, I've always thought that you have a good voice and you're well-spoken. So is this something that you would um, be open to? And um, and I said yes at the time, just because I thought it was cool and it would be interesting. And um you know, 500 episodes later, it's something that I love to do because there's there's a couple of reasons, actually. One is that it gives me like uh, a foot of depth across all of medicine. Like I kind of talk to doctors about everything. Um, the second thing is it uh, teaches me how to ask better questions and just to be a better interviewer. Um, and, and third, I get to have all of this amazing audio equipment <laughs> at my disposal, and it just helps me to create better content. So it's been great. And I think that it ties in really well to just everything that I do. You know, I think we're constantly having conversations, whether it be with our customers or conversations like the one that I'm having with you. And so um, it's, it's like putting in reps constantly and also learning at the same time. Yeah, that's awesome. That that's really cool how you uh, how you kind of fell into the the role. And yeah, I agree. I think you've got a great voice for for podcasting and radio, so it makes sense Thank why you. she uh, why she leaned into that. I want to dig into that piece. You said asking better questions. I think this is something that we can all do, whether we're creating a product from you know a business, we're talking to customers, we're you know just in general. How how do you think about asking better questions? And what did what tips do you have? Um, or things that you've learned throughout your your journey? Yeah, so I think 
broadly, you should always try and listen more than you talk. And you hear this advice a lot, and yet a lot of people don't necessarily follow it. I think a good rule of thumb that I usually like to tell people is kind of the red light, green light rule, meaning like if you are at a stoplight and you're talking past the time that it takes for that light to change to green, for example, you're probably talking too much. Um, so unless someone asks you a directed question and asks your thoughts on something, you should always try to listen more than you're speaking. I think that everyone uh, that you speak to has a very unique perspective and story. And sometimes it's very easy to write people off and so the second piece of advice in terms of asking good questions is to come with it uh, or come to the conversation with an open mind, right? Like you never know where you're going to get nuggets of wisdom. And this is very true when you're building software. You know, I think we have gotten the most insightful pieces of feedback uh, from the people that maybe on the surface you would least expect. Um, so I think that that's also uh, very important. So yeah, that, that's maybe some two tips off the top of my head. Yeah, thanks, Prakash. So sure. do you have an example of where you've gotten those pieces of nuggets so that you weren't expecting? You know, let's see. Uh, I would say that there was one customer in particular who was always very quiet. Uh, he came to our office hours um, a lot. Um, but I noticed that in just in terms of the usage patterns of uh, using Xano, that he was very integrated into the product. So very quiet. Um, you know, really, you know, just came and really listened a lot. Uh, and then one day, uh, I uh, actually wanted to volunteer to help him one on one. And after I was able to help him resolve his problem, I just kind of asked him a little bit about it himself. And I guess that's the third piece, like, it's not just about like, what you want out of the conversation, just asking people about who they are, what their aspirations are, will generally lead to foundational insights that you might not necessarily get from uh, something else. So just asking about himself and his aspirations around what he was building really led me to kind of get insight around the approach and how important it is for us to build better education. So I know I'm speaking kind of abstractly, but he, for example, was a product manager at a tech company. He had a very, like, very baseline knowledge of uh, backends and APIs and things of that nature. And at the time, we weren't offering a lot of education for beginners, right? So it really kind of sparked this aha moment that here you have someone that's super passionate about launching an idea into the world, but doesn't have the education to pull themselves from you know A to B. And then once the, they just needed a little bit of a helping hand. So me, for example, giving them the one, one-on-one -on -one support was very helpful. So uh, after that, we basically started asking customers, uh, what's your experience level? And then launching actually videos and putting videos in front of them based on where they were in their educational journey. So it's less about the product itself and more about educating them. And that was just gotten through insight off of a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Yeah. Thanks for thanks for sharing that example, because I think that really highlights what you were saying of asking better questions and getting to know people and how that led, because I think that's one of the things that Xano does really well. And I know we haven't talked about what Xano is, so I definitely want to want to give that floor and context for everyone. Um, but I think that's something that you guys do really well. So it sounds like you actually pulled that out of your customers to figure out how to build what I think is some of the best education for people that are just getting started in the no code space. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And we really do try our best um, because, you know, uh, I think the product is only as good as uh, people's ability to use it, to use it well. And I think that uh, a product like Xano, uh, and just speaking, you know, broadly, we're a no code backend. We're trying to make it very easy for people to launch complex ideas into the world. And so uh, there's, inherently certain concepts that you have to understand. You have to understand what is a backend. You have to understand databases, APIs, all of these things that make the internet and software work. So we, I think, uh, took the stance very early on that we were going to educate our users where they are, right? So we weren't going to say, hey, we're a really technical product and you're not technical enough to use us, but we are always striving to try to educate people, to bring them and to educate them to be better entrepreneurs, better founders, and to uh, also hopefully, you know, build trust with them over time to, uh, like, to say that we're really going to be there to help you along the way. 
Yeah, I like that. I mean, that's a key insight, right? Being able to actually meet people where they are in their journey. Absolutely. Um, and how else are they going to be able to use the product, right? Everyone's at a different level and maybe that, you know, different customer segments and we could probably get into that and how do you design for different groups and, sure. and all that. But I think if you're in the no-code space, you're going to be attracting a lot of people that really don't understand these concepts. And I know I didn't going into no-code building. I didn't know what the heck the difference between a back end and a front end was and how they, you know, I, I didn't know that kind of stuff. And yeah, yeah. Um, it was definitely a, a big learning curve and i'm i still don't know nearly enough about it but um i at least understand the terms <laughs> sure, today sure yeah yeah the, it, it's a journey and um and i think that people aren't born with this information and i think that you have to be empathetic and that's something that i learned as a ux designer around the different types of users and really understanding like again this uh, notion that you have to meet people where they are and educate them uh so they can have better experiences in your uh product and, and i think user experience is that it's really how do you get them to the answers faster in a delightful way um with your product and uh but there is a baseline of understanding in order to like put them on that journey and so uh so yeah i think it, it is it is a profound insight and i think it's something that uh we strive to do uh more and more each day yeah and so definitely want to get into the ux side but i would be remiss if i didn't take your advice that you just so you know greatly laid out there of digging into who you are and what makes you tick right what is what is your unique perspective that you have prakash and so um, there's a couple of things that I'd love to to touch on, but I want to give you that floor. I know that you know in high in high school you started designing websites and building products and doing marketing for different people, and you did that for a number of years. So I'm just curious to to kind of tee it up. What is your unique perspective, and what do you bring that you think is is uh, is unique to the space and just in general? Yeah, um, that's a big question. I I would say that. You know, from a, a very early uh, age, I was kind of always, you know, I've just always been fascinated, like so many people that are probably listening to this, uh, just by technology. And when I started my foray into tech, um, there was no internet. You know, there was like the BBS and dial up and uh, things of that nature. And so, you know, I very much grew up in this world of just, you know, working with modems and figuring things out, playing online uh, video games or BBS video games in, in, in a competitive way. And then uh, slowly from there, I basically was designing websites for my mom's friends uh, and then kind of graduated into more uh, design and user experience design. But the, I think the central theme that went um, throughout that is I always saw technology um, as a vehicle to help people get things done faster and help people get to answers faster. And design was an amazing um, tool on top of that to help make that experience delightful while, while they were doing that. And it was something that I didn't really come to until I was like really uh, into my career at Google, like understanding user-centered design. Um, but uh, technology is this amazing democratizing force, which I, I don't need to explain to this audience, but the design layer on top of it is a way that you can craft experience and tell stories with your products in a way that is so unique and you can reach uh, so many different people in this very unique way uh, and, and through the lens that you kind of view the world. And so I would say that kind of my perspective and my insight is always around trying to create delightful experiences, uh, whether it be in my consulting work, like helping them do it there or, or with Xano, how do I help people create really wonderful experiences to help others get to answers faster? So um, that's kind of where it is today. That's, that perspective is constantly evolving, but uh, I hope that answers the question. <laughs> it does, it does, yes. What's, yeah, what's the lens that you're coming at this from? And I think that, that tees it up. Prakash, what is user-centered design? You use this term, if, if you're not familiar with it, like what is user-centric design? Yeah, so I think one of the best ways that I can explain it is when I started at Google, they had a, a number of tenants. And one of the core tenants for Google was focus on the user and all else will follow. And what that really means is that when you really focus on your customer or the people that are going to get value out of your product uh, and really understand who they are and that they're all... Uh, potentially different and then design for that. Well, I think that the philosophy around how your product uh, is presented and also the success of your product really changes. And so user-centered design is really following a customer or a set of customers and their journey 
for them being successful in your product. Love that. Yeah, that makes makes a lot of sense. And so how can people think about applying these concepts? And I'm going to kind of pivot it here to the no code space. So if someone is yeah. thinking through, they want to build something, they've got an idea. How do you apply these principles? And like you said, put the user first and everything else will follow. Yeah. So I always tell people that the best thing that they can do is to really start with a user journey map. And if you haven't heard of a journey map before, you can look it up online. There's a lot of examples, but basically the thing to do is to basically look at, or I guess focus first and foremost on what is the problem your product is solving in the world, right? Um, and what are users doing today to solve it, right? So taking something as simple as, for example, project planning before spreadsheets existed, maybe people wrote things down on a piece of paper, right? And uh, your product helps them do this in a digital way and uh, creating like an artifact that then can be shared with people. So thinking about this whole journey about, okay, well, from people that are writing it down on a piece of paper and they're looking for a better way, how do they look for a better way? Where are they finding you? Are they talking in forums? Are they looking on the internet? So that's like kind of the point of acquisition to coming to your site, considering your product that this may be something better for them to uh, actually activating and converting and uh, signing up for your product and then actually finally paying you money once they reach that aha moment. So looking at that linear customer journey before you even design anything, just thinking through each step um, and having an opinion on it, I think it's a really good way to start thinking about building any product. Yeah, I love that. What's interesting is you didn't mention the product really once, right? It was more of like, how do I identify the problem? How do they discover me? How do they learn about my solution that could solve that problem and then get to the point where they sign up, pay me or, you know, adopt the product? At no point did you say, hey, how do you build this feature first or right, which I think is a, is a really interesting thing that I wanted to want to yeah. in on. Definitely. And I think that I, a lot of people will have heard of this term like product market fit and product market fit uh, generally means that you have found a market for your product and like 80 to 90% of the time they're going to buy it. It's a perfect product for them. But I like one of the things that I heard um, a while back was actually flipping it to market product fit. So you're putting the customer first, the distribution channel first, and then your product uh, last. And what this means is you're really thinking about, all right, well, where, where do the people live that actually have this problem that I want to solve? And how am I going to reach them? Because it, you can have the best piece of software on, on the planet. If people can't access it or they can't hear about it, well, it doesn't really matter. So thinking about the market first, distribution channel, and then product in that order typically is a better way to think through rolling out. Yeah, no, I like that. I think that's that's key, right? You can build the best product and spend all your time on the product and then never figure out how to actually reach the people who would get value from it. And you can essentially yeah. waste a lot of time and resources. <laughs> and, and the customer journey helps you work backwards from there, right? So you start at, okay, who are, who, who are the people and what problems do they have? And then where do they hang out? That's kind of where you're starting. Yeah. Makes sense, Prakash. So how did you how did you learn all this? Is this your process? So I know you've got a uh, consulting practice as well as Xano. Can you talk to me a little bit about how how you use this idea of uh, um, customer journey maps and user journeys to ultimately build great products and work with your customers, clients um, on both the consulting and on Xano side? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, first and foremost, I guess uh, it's worth noting that, you know, consulting helps us uh, work on Xano. So none of us have to take a salary. And, you know, we're trying to build the business as far as we can get the business fundamentals right. And I think we'll eventually raise money. So it's just worth noting that's kind of where we are in the journey. Um, from a, cult a consulting standpoint, you know, I always uh, tell people that I approach things in this way. Every product or service makes a promise to a customer about a problem that they're going to serve and or they're going to solve. And I, as a consultant, will look at how much friction you're putting in between that promise and the time to value and that moment of value. And sometimes that is 
lack of clarity in messaging. Sometimes that's no onboarding process. Sometimes that's a lack of uh, instrumentation on measuring that journey, right? And understanding what's happening. So the way that I always look at it is, what promise are we telling the customer? Where are we finding those customers? And what's their experience like trying to uh, get that promise delivered in product? Got it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, right? You've got to figure out where where you are. What's that baseline? Where are things falling short? And I like that idea of going from the promise to value. How quickly can you get someone there? Yep. Right? Yep. Exactly. Because ultimately, that's what that's what we want as as a consumer or a customer. If I'm going to go buy, purchase, or use something. The reason I'm using it, I want to make sure that I get to that end result as quickly as possible. Um, yeah, so like every, that. every, like I said, every product and service has that journey. You know, I don't care what it is. And so, and, <laughs> you know, even though we don't think about it, when we consume products or services today, uh, we go through that same journey, you know, and the faster they can get us to that value, the more likely it uh, becomes a habit for us. And that's when we become that loyal customer. That makes sense. Prakash, you, you mentioned that you guys aren't taking a salary, you haven't raised capital, so you're kind of building Xano. Did Xano come from a need that you identified with your customer base? Or how, talk to me about how you ultimately landed on this idea of a no-code backend product. Sure. So um, first and foremost, I think now might be a good time to define kind of the backend at a very high level. Uh, for the audience in case you don't know. So um, I always like to kind of say uh, or use Amazon's one click buy to describe front end versus back end. So a front on the front end for Amazon's one click buy, you might have a single button that says buy now, right? And then you click that button and it magically shows up at your door and it's amazing. Um, but on the back end, what happens when the user clicks that one click buy button there are a number of business operations that need to happen, right? It's got to check your credit card. Is it valid? It's got to check uh, inventory. It's got to check the distribution centers. It's got to check uh, delivery routes, right? There might be a hundred operations that happen in the back end after you click that button that something needs to process. And that typically is the back end. The back end typically consists of a server, right? A server that kind of uh, is the engine that runs all of this. Uh, an API layer, which is a business logic layer, and a database to store all of your information and all of your records. And Xano is kind of the all-in-one solution that handles all of this. So in terms of how Xano came to be, um, I am actually not the original co-founder. My best friend is. And so we, me and my best friend, Sean Montgomery, worked at Google together. And we also grew up playing video games together when we were like 12, 13 years old. But I went off and went the startup route. And he went off and went the agency route with our third co-founder, Jack. So they were developing mobile apps and web applications for customers over uh, over the course of 10 years. And in that time, they started noticing patterns like, oh, I'm building the same things over and over. Every customer, you got to roll up their API layer, the credit operations, database, all the same stuff. So the first version of Xano was built as an internal tool like eight to 10 years ago, right? And so over time, as Xano started to evolve, I started to see from the outside, like this is getting crazy good. You're be able to create these uh, comprehensive backends without sacrificing, um, you know, in 15 minutes, sometimes, sometimes an hour. So, so I had conver a conversation with Sean and Jack saying, I think that this is the time to try to democratize this ability to the rest of the world. And at that time, the no code movement was just in its infancy, really like it's way more popular than it was back then. But I was saying that I think that if we can give people the ability to do everything that we're doing without having to know any code, uh, I think it would be amazing. And so that's kind of how that relationship started. We basically moved it from an internal tool to productize it. And then in 2021, January, we opened our doors. That's awesome. Yeah. Thanks for kind of explaining that, that journey. And it makes so much sense, right? There's so many things when you're, especially when you're building software that you just have to do in order to function that are just, it's table stakes, right? It's not like you're inventing anything that's crazy, but you've got to have logins. You've got to, as you said, be able to connect to an API layer. Like you've got to have these just different databases. You've got to have these different pieces just to be yeah. able to make the product function before you've actually designed anything about the experience or, you know, the, the kind of magic in, in your point in the one click buy Amazon example, like all of those business operations that have to happen. 
Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I think we were, we kind of were watching the market. We saw this world where there were these kind of disparate tools you kind of had, like, for example, Airtable and AppSheet that a lot of citizen developers were using to store their data. But they even admittedly, like Airtable, if you look at their documentation, they're like, you should not build like a scalable application with us. So people were duct taping things to get together to get their ideas out into the world where we're like, look, I think what people really want when they go to launch uh, an amazing idea, they don't want to learn about like Kubernetes and scaling and orchestration, but they do want to rely on infrastructure that they know they can start with and scale with. So let's provide that to them. Let's make it accessible to them and let's educate them on the different components. So as they grow as a company, they're able to understand what's happening and also appreciate all of the infrastructure that we're giving them. Yeah, no, that makes sense, Prakash. I think that's a great insight, right? Because as someone wanting to build a, a product, I want to make sure that it scales, that we're doing things right, it's secure. But beyond that, as long as it works, that's all I, that's, you know, that's what I care about. And I, there's so many different ways that you can duct tape stuff together to your point, have done that with Airtable and Zapier yeah. and like all these just different links, which are, which are great tools. But, you know, having that single source product is definitely something that's needed and in demand. So you guys have, have struck on a, on a good opportunity, um, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is, I mean, this is kind of part of your journey, you know, when uh, in, in terms of building your, uh, your app and your product, um, you do what it takes to get it out the door, right? And so you kind of look at these different tools, you duct tape things together, but eventually you kind of want to graduate into something that you can trust, that you can rely on, and that is more sustainable as you build the business. And so, you know, I think everyone goes to this journey as an entrepreneur. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So what is what is the the hope for Zeno? As you said, obviously, this no code, low code movement is is growing in popularity. Um, I actually think and I don't know your take on this, but I think that Web3 is going to push more people into the no code space because a lot of some of those tools are very much thinking from that lens. Um, there's obviously a lot going on there, but I, I think just from multiple angles, there's a lot of interest, whether you are a developer or you're not a developer in no code and using no code as a way to grow and scale and build products more quickly. Yeah, you know, I, I just think over time, we're going to just see more and more creators come into the marketplace. I think that the last stat that I heard was in the entire world, billions of people, there's like 20 million quote unquote engineers that develop the things that we use every day, which is such a small number, right? If you think about like verse, like in contrast to the, the rest of the world, it's a small number of people that are developing the things that we use every day and power all the, this amazing technology and innovation. So now uh, with these no code tools, the surface area around what it means to be an engineer and a creator is getting larger and larger and larger. And I personally believe that the term no code is just kind of the word of the moment, but soon enough, people aren't going to talk about that. They're just going to talk about the tools that you use to build things. Right. And syntax will be thing, a thing of the past. Like think about like, you know, if you have ever met your uncle or, uh, or uh, someone maybe from the baby boomer generation, they'll talk about Fortran, right? They're like, yeah, I used to use Fortran to like, you know, program back in the day. No one, like in this generation, no one knows or thinks about Fortran anymore. In the same way, no one's going to really think about hand rolling code. They're going to use these no code tools yeah. or these tools to build their ideas. So as that surface area expands, you know, we're just going to see more and more innovation happening. And I think to your point, Web3 is also pushing this movement of decentralization, people kind of having more security and privacy around the things that they build. And these tools, even for us as founders, we're thinking about how can we stay ahead of the, ahead of the curb and be a part of that movement? Like, you know, whether it be logging with a MetaMask or think about ways that people can uh, build uh, in a distributed way, like we're already thinking through this. So, and I, and I know th that we're not the only one. So I'm just excited to see that surface area of development grow. Yeah, I love to hear that precaution. I think it's a great point, right? I read, I was reading an article was a couple of years ago, I think that was talking about how there's still Cobalt developers. There's not many people that can still code in Cobalt, but because of like government agencies have legacy infrastructure that are on Cobalt, yeah. they get a ton of business, but yeah. no one knows what the hell that it like that language is anymore. And to your point, like all of the languages that we've developed have made it easier to write code. 
So if you're going back, you're no longer, you were, no one's even coding with ones and zeros anymore, which was the original code, right? So we've That's exactly kind right. of continued, if you actually look at the history of software development, we've made it easier and easier and easier. Previous generation might have looked back and said they're not even writing code because we've made it easier and easier to develop software and products. And so I think you're, you're spot on. That's Yeah. A lot of these no code tools, it's about abstracting away the complexity. And that's what, how we think about um, Xano and the back end. You know, back end and business operations, it's, n it's not easy. No matter which way you slice it, you're communicating with different systems and you have to be very articulate and definitive around how systems communicate with each other. But what we can do is abstract away the syntax. We can abstract away, you know, all of the complexity of like variables and filters and things of that nature. So for you, it's just about if you can describe it to me, what you want to happen, then you can make it happen within our products. And these no code tools, um, I, I think to your point, are basically just standing on the shoulders of a generation behind them that has abstracted things further and further. So it's gone from zeros to ones, to programming syntax, to uh, visual uh, designers, to now these no code tools of today. And it's only going to improve from there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Prakash, I'm curious though, you had an interesting journey of how you guys have developed Xano going from that internal tool to productizing it and launching it. What are some of the challenges? Because it hasn't, I'm sure it hasn't all been, you know, sunshines and rainbows and a lot of success. Can you talk about some of the challenges that you guys have faced um, as you've built out the business? Yeah, you know, I think that building any business is hard. And I always like to come back to this quote um, around uh, the, the fact that, well, things that matter take time. And uh, I've, I've said this a couple of times, but I really want it to sit with people because when you're building anything of value or something that's going to like elicit change in people's lives, you cannot get there overnight. And I think that we all as entrepreneurs want things to happen on our schedule and uh, want it to happen very quickly. And I think that in any new startup, that's kind of the struggle that we face. Like we are always trying to rush success out the door where uh, the reality is it just takes more time, like more customer conversations, more iterations. So I think in terms of uh, a struggle, it's really been um, a struggle to really, it, it's one thing to like hear that statement, things that matter take time, but uh, it's another to like really understand it and accept it. And so I think that we have, uh, you know, we've been growing where we've found a lot of success in 2021 but it's taken us a lot of time to, to get there and certainly longer than we thought. Like we, I think we had some pretty ambitious milestones that were overly ambitious and, um, and we've had to kind of pair it back. But I think that's just part of building the business. You know, you kind of have to constantly iterate and set expectations for yourself. Yeah, no, I like that. I mean, that makes sense. I can tell you we've set some pretty ambitious goals and managed to miss those. And, you know, it's, it's easy to get really excited about what you're building and, you know, create a chart that's up and to the right and super linear and reality, you know, life's never works that way, whether it's a business or right. really anything, right? Um, even a weight loss journey, right? You bounce up and down, even if you are having success and you're, you're making progress on health goals. So that's a great, yeah. a great insight. Yeah. And I think it's there. And it's also, I, um, another piece of it is just kind of like growing pains uh, in, in the internal organization. Like, you know, you start off as, you know, just friends that are trying to build something meaningful and you have to grow up quickly, you know, um, who wears which hats, uh, what roles do people take on, what happens, how do you resolve conflict together? Um, especially if you're working with co-founders, having a way where you can communicate and have difficult discussions together is very important because it's worth doing, right? Solving these problems early will help you find success later. And when things get really tough, you already have a framework for how to tackle it together. And so, you know, I think that for us, it's been a mix of, yeah, trying to grow, you know, quickly, uh, but also internally, you know, just learning how we work together as we grow this, uh, this company and this idea and push it out into the world. Yeah, I love that. Thanks for bringing that up, Prakash, because I think that's, that's something that gets 
kind of glossed over, right, is the internal conflicts, especially if you have a, you know, your friends or have a relationship that's beyond just the co-founding role, right? Yeah. Um, have you, what tactics or like strategies have, is, can you give like a an concrete example of, of how you've managed to, whether it's define roles or address conflict, I'm curious about some of the like tactical things um, that people can, can use. Yeah, so I think that first and foremost, just talking early on about certainly percentage share of the company and how it correlates to your contributions and what each of you hope to con uh, contribute to the company over time. I think this is a really important discussion because it's going to bring a lot of things to the surface that you may not necessarily think. Like, I think the natural in, uh, inclination is to say, we'll have that conversation later. But it's important to start with that conversation um, because it gives everyone on the table a clear understanding of where everyone is in terms of their motivations to grow the business. Uh, expanding on that, I think it's also very important to talk about what you want the business to be when it grows up. So let's say, for example, um, you're talking with your co-founder about a scenario where someone brings $5 million to the table uh, to buy you out. Well, one co-founder might be like, amazing, let's take it. And the other co-founder might say, Wait, what? That's like way too little. Like, I, you know, I know uh, we want to grow this to the moon, right? Like we want to scale it as, as big as it can go. Well, that's normally not a conversation you have because typically when you're having this conversation, you're at zero. Um, but it's important just to set expectations around what you do when money comes to the table. So having these difficult discussions and maybe even forward projecting a little bit uh, is really important. And the third thing I think is around how people want to receive feedback. And so, you know, I think having difficult discussions is never easy. And you typically want to set a framework for having them before there's something difficult to talk about. So almost writing an instruction manual for yourself and your co-founders so you can figure out, all right, well, when I need to address something with William, this is how he likes to hear this type of feedback. So there's just, a, a, you're setting expectations before things get difficult. Um, that's kind of the tactical feedback I'd give. Yeah, no, thank you for, for diving deep there, precaution and, and <laughs> taking that at a level deeper. You know, I, I can I can say that that's something that I you know guilty of 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 thinking through what do we want to do long term, but not necessarily saying hey percentage wise let's align it with expectations from a company perspective. I think that's a really great point of not just saying hey here's how we're going to split it, but here's what we expect from one another if we're going to split the company this way. And then yeah, you know, at two I would point yeah go ahead. I would say that that piece of it is almost as difficult as growing your business. Like if you're working on your own, you know, you obviously there's a different set of challenges, but most often you want, you want to have a co-founder for a number of different reasons, at least one. And uh, whenever you're working with someone, there's always going to be disagreements 100% of the time. And, and always, uh, and that's not a bad thing. I also want to say that it's like, it's not bad to see differently about things because oftentimes those perspectives can lead to a better outcome, but you need to address it and address it immediately. So having those, I guess they're called level three conversations often um, is a really good thing. And also, you know, don't underestimate how difficult they can be. Great. Yeah. Thanks for highlighting that, Prakash. I think uh, sure. it's, it's definitely something that that a lot of startups and founders get into some trouble with by not doing that early. Um, and like I said, I know I'm, we're guilty of it, uh, my co-founder and I, and have worked to, to kind of improve some of our own processes of how we talk through challenges. But uh, it's, it's definitely something I think worth highlighting. So we've talked a, a little bit about, you mentioned you know, at some point you, you kind of alluded to it that you may raise venture capital. You talked about how as co-founders, you sit down and talk about what you think success looks like for the business. So what does that look like? What do you, what does success look like for Xano? What do you guys want to accomplish? Well, I think the first thing that's worth mentioning is that 2021, when we opened our doors in January, was really about, I think, proving if there was a there there for the product that we were creating and if we really enjoyed working on it. And I think unequivocally, the answer would be yes. Like we absolutely love what we are doing. All of us want to spend all of our time building this product and making it the best that it can be. And uh, I think in terms of the type of business we want to build, 
you know, we're not looking to build um, a lifestyle business, which is not, not a bad thing at all. I think that we really feel like we have something special and we want this to be the de facto place uh, or we want Xano to be the de facto place that people go to when they want to launch their comprehensive and complex ideas out into the world. And we want to be the trusted partner and that foundation that people can rely on in order to do that. So I think in order to get there, we will have uh, to raise money, um, but we want to do so in a way that is measured and, in, and controlled. And what I mean by that is there's a lot that we can figure out on our own in terms of the business fundamentals, in terms of ideal customer profile or ideal use cases, and in terms of really building an engine that we can then approach an investor uh, uh, with and uh, get favorable terms and like partner with the right ones because they know that we've done our work and now we want their help to kind of get to that next level. So, so yeah, I, I think that's a little bit about, I think, our aspirations for the product and how we view fundraising. Yeah, no, that makes sense, Prakash, right? You want to get as far along as possible, figure out as many of the question marks because one, that puts you in a better position as a founder. It allows you to not have to raise money from the first investor that will give you money and also increases your likelihood that you will be able to raise the money that you need in order to grow the business. So, yeah. yeah and an another thing that I will say is that constraint is a beautiful thing. Like, you know, we could easily take in money now. There's tons of investors that uh, would easily give it to us at, at, on, at favorable terms. But I think there's some, th there is value in trying to figure certain things out yourself. And I think it's being thoughtful with your team around what you will do with the money and how you will deploy it. Because I think too often when founders raise, the question is, well, what should I do now, right? I think that you should have a very clear picture of how you deploy capital when you get it. So I think that we're trying to be as measured as possible and making sure we have a good answer to that question before we do so. Yeah, makes complete sense. Prakash, is there something that if someone's listening audience-wise, you keep mentioning that there's things that you guys want to accomplish, anyone that's listening and any asks that you might have of the audience of, of people, if they're out there, if they're listening, whether it's customers, whether it's whatever that looks like, any asks um, that will help you solve some of those problems in your business that you want to share? I think that what I'd say is that if you are building something and you have an idea in the software space that, you know, absolutely consider giving Xano a try. You know, I think that we are really passionate about helping entrepreneurs succeed. We offer office hours three times a week where all of the founders are on calls help like doing hands-on help. And that's completely free. We have a free version of the product and I want to hear all the feedback. So even if you join and you're confused and you can't use it, you know, like I, I'd love to hear from you. I'm at Prakasam at Twitter. That's P-R-A-K awesome uh, on Twitter. And you can just go ahead and send me a direct message and, and let me know. And also let me know if I can be helpful to you, like outside of using Xano, if there are things that you're struggling with in your business and you have questions around fundraising, around founder conversation, around anything really that we've talked to, like I also want to help you as a founder uh, succeed. And so anything that I can do to be of help, I'm, I'm definitely here to serve. I love that. I love that, right? You hear a lot of the give first mentality, right? In the startup space. And I think that's what, what makes startups success successful, right, is people, founders like yourself, being able to give back and kind of contributing to the ecosystem so that it can continue to grow and people can bring these awesome products that they have, ideas that will change the world to life. So I appreciate you, you uh, uh, offering up that to the audience to reach out to you. Absolutely. Prakash, we've covered a, a lot of ground today and I, I appreciate it. I like to close with a couple personal finance questions. These are very selfish given what, uh, what we're building at Ostrich. And I, and I uh, want to tee these up, but what would you say is your relationship with money? Yeah, you know, obviously I feel like this has changed and evolved over time. But now I think where I'm at in my life is I feel like it's an instrument for you, for me to exact change into the world and for my opinion and my voice and my values to be heard. So obviously, just from a very, uh, from the personal side, I, I use money as an instrument to sustain a lifestyle in the most comfortable way possible for me and my family. But I find that 
the more of it that I have, the more people tend to listen and, and to respect uh, you for better, or for worse. It's just, it's just how the world works. And so um, I think that, you know, as I've gone through this journey of ha having very little from losing a lot in my first startup to now, you know, being in a better place and hopefully in a much better place with Xano, I hope that with more money comes more responsibility for me to kind of get that opinion value and help help others with like given all of that influence and leverage that I that I have. If yeah. it, I hope that answers your question. It, I mean, it's your relationship, right? So there's no wrong answer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I think that's accurate, right? It changes over time. And as you learn and grow, just like every relationship changes over time, right? So yeah, and I think, but I do think like, um, as I have children, so I have a two and a half year old and a five month old, and I think a lot about teaching them about the value of money, first and foremost, teaching them how to learn to earn at an early age, you know, financial independence, self reliance, and the beauty of compound interest. Like, I kind of wish that that was like, really drilled into my head at a younger age, because I think if I would have understand understood that earlier, I think I would have set myself up a little bit better. And, and also the difference between ownership and, and labor, right? So like working hourly, you know, versus owning a piece of something, learning those differences early on. So I think about teaching my children that as they grow up. And then yes, later on, once they are a little more established using money as a source for good and to get their ideas out into the world. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, I think you hit on some key concepts that definitely if people understood, I think it would change many, many people's lives and a lot of solve some of the some of the problems that we've got in, uh, sure. in our society today. What is the best investment that you've made? The best investment that I've made? And are we just talking like fi financial or just it can be any, or is that just like an open ended question? It's an open ended question, however you want to interpret it. So some people go the finance money route, others, it's something else. I think that I used to commute to work a lot. And like, as in like, maybe an hour and a half to two hours a day. And during that time, I used to I started by listening just to music, but I started listening to like podcasts and books specific to like, company building, hearing different perspectives around uh, product, product growth, really using the car as my university, which I know a lot of people do. But I think that the time that I put in, which really was hours and hours and hours of listening and thought really helped me, I think, build really strong opinions and a good foundation for what I'm doing today. So I would say that, you know, Sometimes standing still or taking the time to learn and to really take in information is not a bad thing. And I only say that because we live in this world today where we're always on the move. And any time that we do have, we kind of want to look at our phones. So whether that be picking up a book, reading and trying to improve yourself, I think that's, that's a really important thing. And it, it obviously really has helped me. And it's something that definitely is top of mind when I think of uh, good investments. Yeah, I like that. I like that answer. Are there any podcast books in particular that you'd recommend? I really like the Acquired uh, FM podcast. It's by uh, Ben and David. I don't remember their last names, but they're basically venture capitalists that break down companies and they break them down from their beginnings and they break down how they got to where they are. And they talk about everything in terms of their financials, in terms of the emotional pieces of the founders. And I have learned so much just by hearing the entrepreneurial journey and also the fiscal structures of companies through the, the conversation. So if you haven't heard of Acquired, I definitely would listen to it. Yeah, no, I, I haven't. Um, it kind of sounds like how I built this, but a layer deeper where you're actually getting into the, into the oh, financials. Wait, wait, it's like, a, it's like two hour or three hours sometimes. So it's, it's a long form podcast. Okay. <laughs> I like those. Yeah. I like those. I'm a fan when you can go deep into yep. a topic. Um, and then we don't always make make the best decisions. What would you say is one of the dumbest money mistakes that you've made? I would say when I was doing my first startup, Zabbing It, I like used probably 75% of my 401k to fund the company, which was not a smart decision. And, you know, again, I think that this was very much at a time where I was still learning about 
not only my relationship with money, but around business fundamentals and what it looks like to have success. And it was one of the decisions that, you know, it, it really helped shape and mold me. And it took, it's taken me uh, a long time to come back from that mistake. But now that I am here, I'm glad that I went through that. And so that that's probably one of the biggest <laughs> uh, mistakes that I've made easily. Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one. And you hear a lot of stories of people saying, oh, I emptied it out and then it worked out, but you don't hear all the stories of people that did that. And, you know, it didn't quite work out the way that they anticipated. Yeah. Any lessons you learn in particular from that, from Zabnet? I mean, there are a ton of, <laughs> I call Zabnet like three and a half to four years of me getting the crap kicked out of myself. Because, you know, I think just looking back on it at Google, in many ways, you're put up on this pedestal and you are getting paid a lot of money. You have this big title, but you have never really built something from scratch. You've always had you know, Google support, Google's brand behind it. When you launch products, you're launching to millions of people. So when I left that to go start my own startup and I was trying to get one customer to pay for the product, I was like, wow, this is, this is really different. And I just had to learn what it was to build a business and be measured about, about everything. I learned about fundraising. I learned about, you know, funds to use and not to use, you know, there, there, there are just so many lessons there, but, you know, just kind of specific to the 401k uh, piece of it. I think that kind of related to the, uh, the compounding interest thing, you know, I think that you have to try to be, to educate yourself about money and the different pools of money and what they do to serve the different pieces of your life. And I think that this is what, what I admire about what you're doing at Ostrich. I don't think people have enough fi financial literacy when it comes to these things and especially the different facets of their life. I think sometimes people like I did at Davinet it was like, okay, well, I'm doing this startup. I'm going all in and all in means all money into this thing. Right. And it's going to obviously sustain me and it's going to be wonderful. But because it didn't, like I had to really scramble to kind of get my life uh, back in order. And I eventually did, but it was, that's a hard lesson to learn. And it's a painful lesson to learn. And there's no stress like money stress. I don't have to tell you that. And so I think that, you know, the more you can be thoughtful around like, how am I saving for the different pieces of my life? How am I saving for the different times of my life, like in the future and what I'm investing now? And what are the limits? Like what, what are the guardrails that I'm going to put in front of myself so I don't get things out of control? I think that's probably a few of the lessons that I took away from Zabin. Yeah. Well, thanks for diving into that, Prakash, because I know that it's not always easy to, uh, to re revisit mistakes and things that oh, we wish good. we would have done di differently, right? It's not, it's not fun, but I think that's a great point. Point. And something that I know that uh, my co-founder and I have have really focused on is not tapping into 401ks and retirement stuff and leaving that as that's that and having, you know, the money that we saved to build the business is this separate. And if we end up in a position where we're through that, then, you know, that that means we've got to kind of revisit how we build. But I think that's a great way that you framed it with guardrails. And earlier you'd mentioned, right, sometimes constraints are a good thing. So having yeah. that separate pools of money that are that are kind of guarded um, that still allow you to go all in, but you know still set yourself up for for uh, having a, a decent foundation if things don't turn out the way that you hope that they do. Yeah, yeah, you, you, it's kind of like one of these things where you and you're right. You hear kind of these stories of like the personal sacrifice; they risked it all, the second, third mortgages, and then all of a sudden they made it right. But for every one of those stories, there's like a billion stories of people that really lost everything. And so I think that you don't want to sacrifice the foundation, right? Like your personal life and your relationships, because you cannot build in a clear headed way. You can't innovate from a place where you have need. And so I think that it is so important to make sure, especially that you have this fiscal foundation before you start innovating, because it's only going to make your product better. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Prakash, we've covered a lot of ground. I know we're almost up on time here, and I, I really appreciate you sitting down and sharing your, your journey, your story, and just you know how people can think about, about building great products, UI, UX design, user journeys. We've like I said, we've covered a lot of ground. Um, I do want to leave you with the last word. So if there is anything else that you wanted to make sure that we covered today, I want to give you that space. And then please also let the audience know how they can connect with you outside of this podcast. I really appreciate being able to have this conversation with you. Thank you so much. If you're interested in checking out Xano, 
check out Zano.com. If you want to follow us on Twitter, we're at no code backend on Twitter. And as I mentioned before, my direct Twitter is uh, at Percossum and uh, the offer stands if you need help uh, building or if you need help, you know, just with anything that we discussed on this podcast today, feel free to send me a direct message. Awesome. Thanks so much for sitting down. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, it's fun for me too. Thank you so much, William. On your way out, please share the podcast with others. It's the only way that the community grows and others hear these incredible stories from entrepreneurs and top performers. And of course, pound that subscribe button so you're notified when episodes drop every Friday. I'm William Glass, CEO and co-founder of Ostrich, and of course, your host of the Silicon Alley Podcast. Have a very profitable day. You got no time to waste, but still you hesitate. Caught in a circle.